Okay, so I would like to welcome you all to this uh, guest lecture. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it would be even greater if we would be physically present at the faculty itself. Uh, but the, con the conditions are as is. So uh, me and Professor Smardel decided to actually go on with the lecture anyways, because why not? Um, so yeah, uh, just to kind of break the ice, um, I'd like to say that you are actually my second largest crowd so far to which I'm lecturing to. Last year I did a talk at uh, GraphQL Summit event in San Francisco. And I have to say, I'm, I'm a little bit more nervous than last year because I don't see any of your faces. So, but maybe that's a good thing. So this is just an intro slide to, to break uh, the tension. So let's go into the introduction. So currently I will work at Result. Uh, we are proud to be partners of Kasura and Apollo who are kind of the main GraphQL implementations out there, the topic which we will be discussing about today. So I've been mainly working in the field of web development for the past five years now, maybe more. Uh, but currently I am the head of the GraphQL department at uh, Result. So we focus on managing and producing highly scalable enterprise systems by using GraphQL. This is uh, my team's main goal, and this is the thing which we will be focusing on today. So my other endeavors also include uh, doing courses. So Smart Ninja does intro web development courses, which uh, I've been doing for the past five years now. Uh, I'm also the professor at, at Erudio University, which is uh, a private college teaching programming too there. And I'm also a mentor at Thinkful, which is a web development bootcamp based in the United States of America. So I have a lot of mileage behind me. So I'm hoping that will be my main advantage today. Um, so what's on our to-do list for, for today? Actually, we'll be talking about how we uh, create APIs by using REST. So we will kind of look into how we code APIs today, uh, do some live coding, uh, check out a live case where REST wasn't enough, uh, and then we will slowly be transitioning into GraphQL and how that works. We will also do live coding in GraphQL as well. Uh, and after that, we'll have a short break. After that, we'll have a small Q&A session and then we will also kind of try to present some topics that are open in the academia field regarding to GraphQL. So GraphQL isn't just a programming language. Uh, it isn't just a way of building APIs. It also has some open challenges based in academia as well. So yeah, mostly today I would like to tell you what that web development is a bit more than just doing websites. Um, so yeah, I would like to also welcome you to save this link here. Uh, so this is going to be kind of our main uh, field of communication today, just to make this lecture a bit more uh, live action. So if we kind of go and show it here. Um, so on the first board, we have like uh, general questions which you can post during the lecture itself. So write a pink sticky note if you want to actually uh, post a GraphQL question, a green sticky note if it's a general question, and a blue one if it's anything regarded to our company and what we do. Uh, then we also have the second board which uh, will be explained a bit later on. And the third board is general GraphQL bots, which will be used in the break. So I highly welcome you to, to keep the debate going and 
post as many as que as many questions as you have and we'll see where this goes so i'll keep the link on here for uh, a few more seconds but when we'll have a call to action this link will basically also reappear on the slide itself uh, okay so I'd like to encourage you to kind of open the Jamboard and go on the second board and kind of give your thoughts into web development and what you think that web development represents. Or if you have any experience so far regarding web development, what it represents for, for you and what are the challenges you're facing. While I talk about kind of the history of web frameworks. So Web development is a really like large field. Uh, in the beginning, we only had like a few uh, tools available, so and also just a few browsers as well. But as you can see on this graph, it's like a highly complicated field. So it's a very vast landscape. It's a big space, and this probably only represents maybe like a fraction of technologies that are representing the web today. This one mostly contains web frameworks and how they were developing through time. And we also have like three major fields in the field of web development. So that's front end, back end, and DevOps. Front end mainly focuses on how we do our UIs, and back end focuses on the logic for those user interfaces, while DevOps keeps everything going. So Currently, we're located like here, and currently the main kind of players on this field are, so for front-end are React, Vue.js, and Angular. So these are the three most present frameworks that we use for web development today. There are also a lot of others as well, like Svelte. So new stuff just keeps popping up daily, basically. So it's really hard to keep track and it's kind of nice to actually focus on one direction instead of all three. In the backend space, we have many languages which we can use. Each language supports basically uh, making servers, making requests and stuff like that. So the language choice really isn't that important. So it mainly depends on in which field you're working in. Uh, but the main thing that's kind of connecting our web applications together is actually data. So this is kind of the core of web applications today. And the main questions are, how do we actually provide data? How do we fetch data? And these are kind of the topics that we will be exploring in today's uh, lecture. So as you can see in this animation, uh, the field was a bit different. A few years ago, we only had like PCs. But then uh, mobile devices came, tablets came, IoT devices came, and this space kind of started changing rapidly. So we will actually be diving into REST now and how REST works. So I don't know how much uh, background you actually have in this, so we will just be kind of repeating some of the basics here. So basically the http protocol supports these methods get post put patch and delete and with these methods we're basically doing requests on our servers and servers provide us with data so each language framework or server implementation has kind of these methods implemented so you can implement them on your backend and usually what these methods return is some sort of response and today we mainly have a response that looks something like this so this is called a json uh, but in older applications or legacy systems you'll also see xml as the primary response um, but today mostly we focus on data that looks like this so when we do a request on our web server this is what we're actually going to be getting back some sort of string which then our front end can actually parse and expose the data from it and present the end interface to the user so 
We'll be focusing on a simple kind of application today. So let's imagine that we are building a simple block platform that only has like three entities, users, posts, and comments. Uh, and users are actually, we're going to simplify this very much. So users will have an ID associated with them, a name and an email address. Posts will have also an ID content and the ID of the user that posted that post. And comments will also have an ID, the comment text, the user which posted the comment and the post ID to which this comment belongs to. So posts have a single author, so we won't be kind of uh, doing over complicating things here. Uh, comments will also be having a single author, which will be the user, and posts can have multiple comments. And we will ask ourselves a question if we have this sort of application, this sort of model, how can we fetch data for a single post? So if we are a front-end developer, how will we be fetching our data by using REST? So Usually, if you want to fetch data for a single post, what we first do is we will fetch the data for that post. And the post will then contain the ID of the user, which is uh, posting that post. And then the next stage is, so let's fetch the user of that post. And then if you want to fetch the comments, we also need to have some sort of request where we can send in the post ID and we receive the comments. So that's like a lot of work. And let's do some live coding now and hope that everything works. And that's why the subtitle is living on the edge because live coding is uh, a really risky thing to do. Uh, we will be checking out this um, application. So it will be built upon Node.js. Its database will be MongoDB, which is a non-relational database. It's, it's an object-based based database. And Docker will be the thing that's going to be connecting our whole thing together. So, okay. So this is uh, a very kind of plain model on how we develop a backend for an application. So this is our service. You can actually see that uh, we need to have some sort of structure. So Docker is the thing that's going to be running our local environment. So by running our local environment, Docker will actually allow us to create a private network and also install our application in a Dockerized world, which basically means that it will not affect our system. So. If we have multiple versions of frameworks or te multiple technologies, we don't have to install those on our operating system. We can just basically use Docker to set up a local environment and this won't mess up any of our data or uh, do or, or mess up different versioning schemes. So yeah, this is a Docker file. We won't be going into details here, uh, basically, this this is a sort of specification which defines what what we will be running so we will be running one graphql server and one local rest service and we will also bring up a local database so i'm just going to take a moment here to to check the chat if by any chance the screen is not being shared and people are actually saying everything to this Okay, everybody is seeing the screen, so this is great. So yeah, basically we have a source folder here and as developers, it's really nice to have a structured way of structuring your project. So we, we don't want to have uh, a lot of files that have interconnected things together. So this is basically structured into models, routes, and utilities. Models contain the models for our data. So we said that we will be building a block system, which means we need a model for the user, a model for the post, and a model for the comment itself. 
And if we check just one of these files, uh, this is basically just written in the documentation itself on how you use this. And don't worry, I will post the final project online. Uh, and the way we define a schema in Node.js, at least for our database, MongoDB, we only create a schema object and then inside that schema object we define which kind of fields we will be having in our object. And for the user, we will be having a name and an email, just like we said. And for the email, we will be specifying a property that the email needs to be unique. So we can't have users having the same email. This is basically our username. Uh, down here, we have a thing, thing called Swagger, which we will discuss a little bit later on. So we will practically ignore this for now. But basically, this is the way how we specify our models. And then afterwards, we can actually use these, these models to create an object and then call functions on that object to either insert things into the database or delete things into the database or update things. Uh, this is basically a really nice thing to actually uh, start developing like really fast. So these are our models. So comments contain a comment and a reference to the user and the post itself. So this is basically the same as using a uh, relational database. So even non-relational databases like MongoDB support, let's call them foreign keys, but these aren't officially foreign keys, uh, which we can write into our objects. So for the comment, we write in the reference to the user and the reference to the post. For the post, we only have the content and the user. And as you can see, the code is basically repeating itself. Once you actually know how to do one schema, you can basically just copy it into the other schemas. So there's not basically a lot of things to do here, but it is wise to kind of make a schema of your model first to actually have a database representation that all of your other kind of teammates can actually see. Okay, going into the roots, so these, are the files that actually contain our REST endpoints. So REST endpoints are basically just URL addresses which you can open and those URL addresses return some data to you. Uh, if it's a GET request, you provide the data for that request in the URL itself, which we will soon see. If it's a POST request, then we basically provide the data either by sending a JSON object or by sending a regular POST request. And yeah, if we just go into the main file before diving into the roots themselves. So we basically create, so there are a bunch of tutorials online how to create a server in Node.js. We are using the Express framework and it's basically a one-liner. So these two lines actually create a simple HTTP server on which you can actually build stuff. So here are some course definitions. I won't be diving into this. Uh, just be aware that this is a no-no thing to do. This basically tells us that any site can make requests on our server. So this is just for practical purposes here so that we don't uh, fill ourselves with the details. Uh, here we have a thing called Swagger, which we will dive into soon. And here we specify our body limit. So we don't want a request to be larger than one megabyte. Even this size is actually quite large, but this is just a precaution in order to prevent uh, people from kind of exposing our server to different things that we don't want to actually do. So let's get into the routes. Maybe a better representation of this is to look at the Swagger interface which is actually an interface that we can, we can open on our service. So this is, this is just a library. Those comments that you were seeing basically specify these endpoints. And we can use this interface to actually test our service. So if we want to test how to get a post, we can actually open this, then specify the ID of a post click on try it out and it will give us a response. So 
as I was saying, as a backend developer, in order to do that simple task that we were focusing on, so to create a very simple block system, we need to have users, posts, and comments. And for the users, we will have one post request, which allows us to create a new user by sending in the email and the name. And then we will have a simple get method, which we will provide an ID into, and that method will actually return us the user based on the ID. Um, a heat of warning, I didn't actually implement any try-catch statement in this project, so if you actually provide an ID that doesn't exist, an error will be triggered instead of triggering uh, 404. But yeah, we're doing a simple example here. So for the post, we only have one post request to which we provide user and content, and then this will actually create our post in the database. And again, another get method to which we provide the ID of the post and the post object gets returned to us. The same is done for the comments, but for the comments, we have two get methods, one where we fetch a single comment by its ID, and one where we actually fetch all the comments from a specific post, which has a specific ID. So let's go back into the code now. And again, if you have any questions, just post them on the Jamboard during, and we will try to resolve those after the breakup. Uh, okay, so routes. These are basically our REST endpoints. And we could basically write all of these into one file, but then we would have a big mess. So instead of having all the endpoints in one file, we basically just divided them into different files, which actually have these uh, endpoints by defined by the model itself. So it's easier to find them and the code is easier to read. Um, and to kind of give you an example, so I actually have one user inserted in my database already and I've prepared some to-do things so that we could do actual some live coding. Um, what we need to implement is the fetch of the user. So we already have a post method here which receives the name and the email and then saves the user into the database itself. We only need to implement the fetch method here. So let's start by doing this. At the top, I've imported the user model from the models we've defined. So this is basically our Mongo object here in uh, JavaScript, which will allow us to easily manipulate data from our database. So yeah, we need to get extract the parameter from the endpoint itself. So here, this basically specifies if you have this sort of notation for what your request looks like. It basically tell you this is the parameter of the get request. And you can basically read that parameter into the variable itself by writing something like this. And this is actually now the ID. So I'm just going to write up a comment. If our endpoint looks something like this, slash user slash one, then this one will get written into the ID variable. So this means that this is the user that we are fetching. Okay, and then what we basically do is we just say let user equal await and we have the user model and we have methods on the user model. And then we just do this. So basically we just return the user and that's it. That's our implementation. So these Mongo models, so this library is called Mongoose. It's actually well documented and basically you don't have to write any statements like in SQL. So this is called like in SQL, that would be called an object relationship uh, modeler, but here, uh, because it's a, uh, it's not a relational database, this is actually just a model with methods on it, and in the 
back the library does its stuff so it's really simple even if we check the method which inserts a user we just create a user object and then call save on it and that's basically it so now that we have this implementation let's check it out if it actually works so i'm also using a call a tool called mongo compass so here we have we connect, we've connected to our local database and inside the blog you can see that i actually have users and posts and users is a collection which contains users and posts is a collection which contains posts and let's try to copy this id and use swagger to fetch it out maybe something will go wrong but let's see okay so this is our response body now uh, basically the method was called so you can see this is the url of the endpoint that we are calling this is the id of the user we are fetching and this is the data we got back so if we check the mongoose tool you can see that basically this is the user that we were fetching we have the name and we have the email and if we want to insert new users we can actually either use this tool to insert them or use the use the post method here um, so you can see that developing or making rest endpoints isn't that hard actually so now let's go back into our to-do list so we've basically implemented this so let's delete it uh, and let's check so this is the graphql part we're not here yet the comment section so i've written a get method now which returns us a user let's see how we create a method which actually allows us to insert a comment so for the comment we said that we will be receiving comment user and post for its data and this is going to be fetched from our body so we can actually say user post and comment and fetch it out of the body object and now up here i've also kind of imported the comment model which has the same methods that were available in the user model as well so let's check how the post method works for the users and we can basically do the same thing here so i can just copy this code here go into the comments and create a new comment here and instead of providing the name and the email i would just be providing the user the post and the comment so basically here i can uh, give you a small tip maybe backend uh, development looks like it's a crazy thing or it's hard but when developing endpoints like this you can see that it's a lot of kind of copy paste work at least in this example uh, and one thing i didn't do well is i've reused the variable so i need to do this instead of this and this is how we do an insertion into the mongo database and that's that's basically it so we don't need a lot of work to do this and this is how we actually develop rest apis so we've cleared our to-do list for our service and i can also now show you so if we fetch a single post let's check this method out So here the ID of the post is this and let's try it out down here you can see that the response is the post which we were fetching okay let's go back to the presentation now so this was basically a successful live coding challenge so that's okay everything was working uh, 
So this is basically what we were doing, right? We were creating endpoints. And this is just a list of the endpoints which we need to actually get some data from our backend. And these are all get methods. So this is just for fetching data, not for creating data or inserting or deleting or any other manipulations. So we are fetching users by ID or we fetch all of our users. Some sort of pagination is uh, used here. We fetch posts by ID, we fetch posts by user ID, then we can fetch comments, we can fetch comments by a comment ID, and then we can also fetch comments by a specific post. So this is actually quite a crazy thing. And imagine having a really large application. So these endpoints basically start expanding vastly, and it's really hard to control and to manipulate them all. And that's why we actually have Swagger, which I was showing you, which gives us at least some bit of interface and documentation on how we can manipulate our endpoints and how they look like. So let's become a front-end developer now. We've created our backend, and now we want to show a single post with its user info and comments. So how does that look like? How many requests will we actually need in order to get this information. So basically imagine that we are having a web application which works on mobile, tablets, uh, various devices, even watches. We will actually need to do at least three requests to fetch the data we need. And this is actually not very optimal. So in order to get a post with an ID 10, we need to call the first endpoint. And then if we want to get the info about the user that created that post, we need to call the second endpoint. So the information about which user has written post with the ID 10 is actually in this response. And then we need to call another endpoint to actually get the data for the comments by the ID of that post. So we need to do at least three requests to get the data we need. So I'm not saying we did, we, we did an optimal implementation of the backend. So we could basically do one endpoint which gives us all this data, but this is just one case. So a block can get very complicated uh, and to actually produce new endpoints is quite a big thing. So this, this will expand through time and it will give us a lot of headaches down the road. So you're saying that actually REST doesn't seem too bad from one perspective. It's easy to implement, it's well documented, it has a long history of usage, most of the problems are already solved. So you're wondering what could possibly even go wrong long term. As I've said, we will need to produce new endpoints each time we have a new way of fetching our data. We will need to adapt existing endpoints when new business cases arrive. We will also need to write documentation for the new endpoints we are writing. And our endpoints will just continue to grow in numbers and in complexity. And as our data model changes, we also need to adapt the new endpoints as well. So long-term REST has a lot of maintenance going for it. So if it's a small app, REST is a really nice way to go. A lot of big applications use REST as well, but long-term it's like really complicating things. So something like this. So the REST, protocol is actually almost 20 years old. And today, not just the customers that are visiting our sites uh, are consuming the data, but clients as well. So if we have APIs, then we expose those APIs to other clients which consume that data. And we also have various devices, mobiles, tablets, PCs, IoT devices, and even though 
bandwidth is cheap nowadays, hosting isn't. So the more requests you do to your server, the more bandwidth you're actually using. And creating specific endpoints for your clients is basically a pain from a maintenance perspective. So imagine having a bunch of clients for, for a web application you did, which exposes some shopping data. And then client X comes to you and says, hey, I want to get the data X and Y and Z. And then another client comes and says, hey, I also want to get data Y and Z and W. And I want to get it in a specific way. And then you have like two ways. You can either say to your client, well, we won't be doing specific endpoints for you, but you can fetch the data by using the existing ones. Or you can create a specific endpoint for that client. And yeah, in, in a long-term perspective, that really complicates things. And let's check out a real example of this so that I won't be just talking X and Ys and Ws. The Facebook problem. So Facebook in the old days had like a real big news feed. It didn't contain a lot of ads in those days. People actually shared stuff that was important and you could actually see posts from your colleagues or friends. Nowadays things are a bit different, but this news feed was actually a really big thing. So if you imagine the news feed feed contains a lot of data about users, the posts, how posts are connected, which users are posting posts, and then the photos are also connected to uh, some sort of user or post or whatever. So it's, it's quite a complicated thing from a data perspective and from an endpoint perspective as well. And in 2012, Facebook was shifting into mobile and they adopted HTML5 on mobile. So they didn't do a native app. They did an app based on HTML5 and its features. And in long term, they noticed that what happened is there was too much data consumption and high network usage. Why? Because, okay, if we shift back into 2012, we didn't have unlimited phone packages, so we couldn't have like eight gigabyte, gigabytes of data. Uh, and what was actually happening is a lot of devices, mainly mobile devices, tablets uh, and other things, they were still consuming way, uh, their data in the same way that they were consuming on the desktop device. And in those days when bandwidth wasn't cheap, that was quite, quite a, let's say, not a good thing uh, because even networks weren't as fast then. So APIs from Facebook weren't kind of designed for that kind of data usage. And this is basically nested recursive interconnected data and we have like a bunch of endpoints that those poor mobile and tablet devices were calling and that was presenting a real problem for facebook so not just the consumers even the clients of facebook were consuming that data so facebook has a lot of apps uh, in those days, I think Farmville or whatever the game was, was quite a popular thing. And it was using Facebook's data, Facebook's APIs. It was fetching data about users, about their posts, about their friends. And there was a lot of data consumage. So what Facebook wanted is to kind of create some sort of thing where each client could consume the data they actually need. So not just a whole bunch of data for the user profile. So an endpoint for Facebook would look something like this. So if we have an endpoint which gives us the data about the user, it would give us their profile image, their email, their name, their address, and all of the other data, which maybe some app actually doesn't need. Maybe some app only needs the link to the image or the name of the person. So they wanted to build a system that does exactly something like that. And also 
reduce complexity with that, reduce data consumption, and also reduce network consumption. Basically, make life easier. Uh, and this is the thing that actually led to the thing which we will be talking about today, uh, GraphQL. So our goal is actually to define some sort of unified query language to achieve some sort of order, cohesion, and a language that actually works across all type of devices. And also a language that can work upon REST as well. So if you check the graph on the left, we have IoT devices, desktop, uh, mobile, tablets, and this icon is basically for your clients and other consumers. And if you have some services on our backend, so these are basically our REST endpoints. You can see that the graph of consuming the data is like quite large. So they keep calling different endpoints to, to get different types of data and the data usage is quite high. And Facebook basically wanted to introduce some sort of order and cohesion into that. So let's have a unified front in front of those services to actually make life simple. But what would that actually be? And we have this thing called the data graph. So we've introduced some order into our chaos where all of the devices can actually call a single resource, which then communicates to the other endpoints. And this is basically our end goal, to keep the graph on the left side single pointed where not all devices call all the services up front. And what is basically a data graph? So I'm guessing that this brings up memories from your discrete math class. Uh, so the word GraphQL contains a very important word, and that is a graph. So if we check our example for the blog where we have users, posts, and comments, our data is actually connected. So the user is connected to the post, so user has posts. And the post node is connected to the comment node, so the post has comments. The user node is also connected to the comment node. And we can connect all our data in some sort of graph, and each of our entities in the end will be a node which is connected to another node. And each of the nodes actually has data associated to them as well. So for the user, we have name, email, and ID, post, ID, content, and user ID, and comment, ID, comment, and post ID, and user ID. But these aren't that important because we can actually get those by just circling back to that connection. So imagine a language that allows us to do graph-like queries with a specific data in mind. And this is basically what GraphQL is all about. So if we become a front-end developer now, again, in the world of GraphQL, um, let's review how we fetch data using REST. So we have these three endpoints, and the main pain for front-end developer is actually to understand these endpoints and what they mean. Here we have like logical naming conventions, but we don't know how these three things are connected together. So the front-end developer basically needs to understand the business logic before actually doing anything. So he needs to know that the users are connected to the posts and that the users are connected to the comments. And if he doesn't know that, then he doesn't know how to fetch the data. So Imagine that the front-end developer could actually query data like this. So basically, at the top, we are fetching a post with an ID called 10 and fetch a user that's connected to that post and fetch its name as well. And then also fetch the comments and the user that belongs to those comments and their name as well. And from a front-end developer perspective, that's like a gold mine. Because you, you can actually just write a single query and get all the data you need. And this sort of language could actually reduce 
the complexity of how we fetch our data and also reduces network traffic because with a single query we can get all the data we need and also fetch only the data we need because with rest we would be fetching all of the data here we only fetch the username with rest we could we also get back the email and with the comments we also get back the ids and all of the other stuff we basically don't need in order to present our data and this is basically graphql so this picture basically contains a list of terms that are connected to graphql so we have schemas mutations variables queries subscriptions fragments whatever we won't be diving into all of these and please stay with me this this isn't just theoretical this language is actually out there and for the past four years a lot of developers have been using it very well in their development efforts so let's dive into the schema first and again bear with me after this part we will actually show you how this thing looks like and you'll be amazed by how simple it is so in when we were developing our rest service we were defining models in graphql we basically need to do the same thing we need to define models but in graphql terms that's called a schema and schema has types types are basically the nodes in our graph so we have a user we have a post and we have a comment and for each of those we have the data which is connected to them it's important to uh, emphasize this that each node needs to have an id associated with it so this is a required parameter and you need to specify that in each of your types so we can reference different types so when we were having the user node that's present in the post node so you can see that the data that's defined in the post node also contains the user and the user is a reference to the user node and the comments is a reference to the comment node here you can notice the brackets which means that this is an array of comments it doesn't just give you a single comment as a reference to the post because the post has multiple comments and this will return multiple comments the comment also has a user reference which references the type so this is how we define our schemas in graphql so basically if we go back to this graph by using this schema language we actually define this we define the references between our nodes after this we have a thing called query so queries are basically uh, our types that are used for data fetching and we need to define methods on them which we can actually call so for our task we basically want to fetch a post fetch its uh, user and its comments so we define a method called post and as its input and this is a uh, regular convention so you can specify arguments here which this method receives but it's a common convention to actually use the input attribute and defined a uh, field called read input or whatever you choose to call it which can then contain the data you need to input as a front-end developer to receive the data you need and this exclamation mark also denotes that this data is required so out of the box with graphql we also get the checking of the attributes so if by any chance you don't specify an id when you're calling the post query graphql will notify you about this so you don't need to write your own type checking so usually with rest there are patterns which you can use to check what kind of input the users are giving you but here you basically get this out of the box so if it's not a string graphql will automatically say no i can't do this for you and this is basically the name of our query and this denotes what the query is returning so usually here we denote which node the query is returning right and because we are querying a post 
this returns the post. So if it would be an array of posts, it would be denoted in brackets. And this is what queries are used for. So we need to define these things before we actually implement the code which fetches these things. We are actually building our graph. And the thing that's connected widely to GraphQL, and this is basically maybe the hardest thing to understand in regards to GraphQL, is a thing called a resolver. So if we check our post implementation, so we have like a bunch of other data here that's missing, but the references, the user and the comments, which reference the user node and the comment node, uh, we actually need to tell GraphQL how, how, it get, how it can fetch that data. How, how does GraphQL know where to look for that data? And these are basically resolvers. So resolvers tell GraphQL for a specific type where it needs to travel to receive the data to which this node is connected to. And it's basically simpler to actually show you how this works. So if we have a query, so this is the query which fetches our post and gives us the user and comments, this is how it will basically look like. So for the first node, GraphQL knows that we are fetching a post and its ID is 10. So when we write our business logic that fetches that data, we will receive the data for that post. And here we're just making it up that the ID is 10, the content is hello, and that the user ID is one. And then we dive a bit deeper into it. So then when we fetch the post, we need to fetch the user for that post. And because the post node is connected to the user node, we actually know that we are fetching a user with the ID one. So because the post node is connected to the user node, when this happens, when you dive into this part, this node actually knows that its previous node was post with an ID 10 and it can actually actually get this data. So in here we actually know that we are querying a user with an ID 1 because it belongs to that post and we can fetch the data for that as well. So basically in our backend we write the data that gets a user by ID 1 and GraphQL receives this data. So this is basically how this works. This is how a resolver works. A resolver tells uh, the types how the data is connected together and how you will be fetching that data. And in code, it looks like this. So the query is our post and here we actually tell GraphQL where it fetches the data for the post query we defined earlier. So here we would write our business logic. For the post node, we need to define the user and the comments. And if we go back, you can see that these are basically the same names. So the user and the comments here are basically the same names. And here we are defining our resolvers. And inside this method, we will actually receive the data of our parent node, and we can use that data to actually fetch the data which is connected to the parent node. And this is how resolvers actually work. So if you have any kind of questions, just post them on a post-it note and we'll be resolving them later. But I'm guessing that things will get a bit clearer once we show a real life example of this. So we also need to do CUD operations. So CRUD, create, read, update, delete. We've already done the read, which is basically a query. We also need to do create, update, and delete. And for that, in GraphQL, we use mutations. For mutations, we also define the name of the mutations and what they receive as the input. The syntax is basically the same as with queries. And for the input here, when we are creating a single post, we define that you need to give us a user ID and the content of that post, and both are required. So if you have an exclamation mark, 
then that data is required. So each mutation receives an input on what it needs to do and what kind of data it receives. And it can either return the changed object or any other type you prefer. So if it needs to return a boolean, you can write boolean here. If it needs to return an integer, you can write integer here. But here, because we are creating a post, we will return the whole post object back. And this is how update and delete and create works in GraphQL. We define mutations and these mutations trigger our business logic. Another powerful thing of GraphQL is a thing called a subscription. We won't be diving into this one today, but there are a lot of tutorials online. So we really like apps that refresh instantaneously. So if I am using an application which, uh, I don't know, let's say we're op uploading some documents into Dropbox and another person is viewing a shared folder, you want to see the interface to change instantaneously. So once me, that as a person, I upload a document, the person on the other side wants to see that document instantaneously. And in the old days, what you were doing is you were refetching data in, uh, I don't know, every five seconds or something like that to check if something new happened. With GraphQL, you have a subscription for that and you can actually implement subscriptions, which means that the server will notify the consumer that something new has happened and here, this has happened. And you can basically update your front end with this instantaneously and actually achieve live interfaces with this, so live data. So your applications actually become more lifelike and they refresh instantaneously and it's really a good feeling. So if someone deletes a document and you try to click on it, you usually get an error message. But with GraphQL, if you would be using subscriptions, if someone would delete a document, that document would disappear instantaneously on your end if by any chance the subscription is implemented for that. So that's also a really powerful thing uh, in GraphQL and it's really kind of being used in a lot of apps today. So just to kind of compare it, REST and GraphQL. So for create in REST, we use put and post. In read, we use get. For update, we use put and patch. For delete, we use delete. For subscribe, we don't have a subscription for uh, a REST endpoint. So basically we just do queries. In GraphQL, the creation and update and deletion is called a mutation and the read is called a query. An interesting side note here is that when you're doing REST development, you're actually doing different requests. Get, post, put, patch. In GraphQL, the mutations and queries are all post requests. So basically the majority of the requests on GraphQL are done via post. Okay, so enough with uh, theory. Let's actually do some live coding by using a GraphQL server that's built upon Apollo, which is one of the uh, partners at Result. So let's do a little bit of live coding, which almost never fails. So, okay, our service is here. We've done all of our to-dos. So let's just close the things we don't need. And let's open our GraphQL. So, okay, in most of the examples that you will be viewing online, uh, all of the schemas are present in one file, which you can all basically do, but it's not kind of nice so it's really nice to have a separation of your schema to actually uh, make it easier to read so in the schema folder we basically have the code that we were viewing in our slides so the comment the post and the user and the most complicated schema is for the post because we actually implemented the query there and we also implemented the resolvers there so if we check the schema folder it will contain our types, 
our operations and our inputs. So this is the query we implemented for um, our post fetch. And this is the post type. And you can see that this is the schema which we wrote during our slides. Uh, the other files aren't that interesting. So for the comments and the users, we only have types. We don't have any specifics for those. So let's actually go into our to-do list and see what we need to actually code in our project. So what we're missing are resolvers. And what we're also missing are the fetch of our data. So what we're doing here is we are using our REST service, so the one we built earlier, and we want to communicate with that service using GraphQL. And Apollo has a nice thing for that called the REST data source. We just implement a class, and inside that class we can define our calls. So we can do get requests, post requests to any URL. And our base URL for our block service is this one. And what we basically need to do is call those REST methods inside these methods here. So we need to implement the fetch of a post by its ID. And let's do that. So basically, it's a really simple thing here. If you're using a REST data source, you just need to write this dot. And because this will be a GET request, we will just write the ID. Maybe let's write that into the data first. And then this get post will actually call the REST service. Uh, we need to specify the URL address. So our endpoint for our users is basically this. And the data that's returned is in the user object. So basically what this thing does, it gets this URL. It adds this to it, which is basically our REST endpoint. Let's kind of try to refresh that. So this, see, users and querying by ID. And this is our endpoint. And this goes here. Okay, for the post, basically the same thing. We're just querying a different entity here. So posts, and we return the data like that. For the comments, we'll return to that one later. We'll leave it into the to-do now, but you can see that it's basically returning an empty array for now so that this thing actually uh, works and it doesn't break our other things. Uh, Okay, so for the resolvers, we need to basically write where we get our user and when we, where we get our comments. And if we check our main file, this is basically how we construct our GraphQL server. Uh, most of this code is actually boilerplate. The thing that's actually important here is that we have these data sources, and our data source is inside our data file. So this is the thing we were programming earlier. This is the thing that we are exposing as our source. And we call this source our block API. And with this mechanism, so GraphQL has a thing called context. And in the context, you can actually insert data which your methods will then have. And we want to have our block API in our methods. And this is basically the thing we are doing here. So in our resolvers, we go back to our to-do. This is the thing that we get in our data source. And 
inside the source we will actually get our parameters but let's check this out first so let's see what the source contains and what the arguments contain so this is a thing called playground and here we can actually each graphql server comes with it in production usage you basically uh, don't open up this thing but for local development and testing it's a good way of communicating with your graphql server it comes out of the box with uh, the apollo implementation and here you can actually view your schema so here you can actually see our whole schema the thing we've basically written which is now here in one file uh, you can see that we have a query post and we have the user type the post type and the comment type and in the documentation you can actually see the methods that are implemented and you can click on them and actually see what kind of type they are returning and what are the arguments for querying and again this is a really good thing not just for front-end but also for back-end developers because you can instantaneously see how the data is connected and what kind of data your endpoints are actually returning so graphql really kind of simplifies this perspective for a front-end developer so if i click play here you can actually see that because we've written the post uh, query already before that it was null but now it actually receives our data and this is the post which I'm fetching we can also see that in Mongo so this is the content of it but it hasn't resolved the comments yet because we are returning an empty array there and it also hasn't resolved the user yet because we don't know how the user needs to be resolved and this needs to be written here but what we can see is just open up the logs so this is just a tool for viewing containers called the doc station and here we can open up our graphql server and see our logs and here you can actually see these two print printed out source and arcs and this source is actually the post node so this is our root node and we got the data for that root node because we already fetched the post and we actually got that data from the root node so here in the resolver we actually get the data for the post so the post contained the user id and here we can write the logic which will fetch our user based on that information so basically we have our data sources which contain this thing block api and if we check what we have here we have get user and inside that we need to provide the user id and that comes from our source data we check it out it's the user parameter okay let's see if this works now hopefully see the user was resolved now because we gave in the resolver we actually wrote the, the business logic that's needed to resolve that user and these are basically resolvers i'm hoping this cleared the picture up a bit so in the sub nodes that we have resolvers actually take care of the data fetching so let's finish up this example now we also need to get the post comments based on the id of the post and again this is going to be the same thing we call get and let's check our rest api documentation to see what we need to fetch so we have comments posts and id
So I need to just recheck how the logic looks like for the service and what it returns. Let's see routes, comments, get. It's this one at the top. Posts by ID. It returns comment. So yeah, let's go back into that. Let's call it like pod data dot comment. Okay, and let's go back. So now we've implemented a method that actually fetches our comments from the backend server. So our REST service. And let's go back into our resolvers now. And again, if I just console log the source here and try to run the query on the server itself, you can see that again, I get the data of the post node. And this is again the data that I need in order to fetch the comments. So the ID of the post is located here. So what's our method called get post comments? Okay, we've cleared our to do list and now let's see if the thing works. Okay. It works. We still have an empty array and that's because we don't have any comments yet. You can see that the comments collection does not exist yet and I haven't written any comments in it yet. We can basically use this interface to insert a comment. So let's insert one. Uh, the ID of the post is this. Now I just need to get the ID of the user as well. And the comment was inserted. Let's also check the database if it's there. It's here. Now let's see if we get something out of it. Okay, we have an empty array still, but we can see that the request was that the request was triggered. So this may be a slight error in our code, but we won't be getting into this one. I'll try to solve it during the break and show it later on. Uh, but you can see how this works. So this is GraphQL in in practice, and it's really nice to kind of separate your schemas so that it improves readability. So in the beginning, in the beginning, it can actually feel like it's like a really hard thing. But once you get to know this stuff and see how it's connected, it's actually really easy to develop with GraphQL because it speeds up development time. And it also simplifies how front end developers fetch their data. So we had like a really simple example here, but this can actually get quite large and you can imagine that it's really easy to query data in this way and you can easier understand the business logic of your customer or your client. So now I propose a small break. Uh, I would like to invite you to open up the Jamboard again and post in any GraphQL questions and your thoughts on GraphQL on board number three to actually hear our thoughts on what you think about this kind of data fetching. And after this small break, let's say that it's going to be about eight minutes, um, we can discuss the questions regarding that. And I'll also show you how GraphQL connects well into academia and what are the challenges that GraphQL is facing there.
So please, to keep the communication going, uh, open up the sticky notes and dive into them. And I'll see you in eight minutes. Okay, so I'm back and I've just stopped my screen share just for a moment to kind of show that I am a real person that actually exists um, located in the beautiful municipality of Tolmin, surrounded by nature. So, well, now surrounded by four walls, but uh, yeah, let's go back to business. I'm going to reshare my screen back. And let's just answer a few questions from the Jamboard, if there are any. So I'm going to be answering the GraphQL questions, the general and the result questions. Maybe I'll uh, go back to those in the end. So the second part of this lecture won't be as long as the first one. I'll probably just just show you a bit of insight into what's going on in the academia perspective for GraphQL. Um, okay, so the GraphQL questions. Resolvers basically define our connections between data. Yes, with, with the resolver functions, you basically define how you're going to be resolving the data you defined in your types. So if we go and check for instance, our post type, the resolvers basically define for each type how the data gets resolved. So for the comments, we define specifically for this field how it is going to be resolved. And for, we go into anything else, basically the user field also we have to define how GraphQL is going to resolve that field. So basically we tell the node where it needs to go. So your previous node gives you the data it already has. And the next node receives that data because it knows how they're connected. And then inside the new node, you actually say, okay, so this is the data I have. I know I'll be searching for comments that are connected to the post I'm currently in. So that's how you write your resolver logic. So that's how it basically works. Okay, so there's that. Is it only for JS development? No, of course not. Um, you also have other GraphQL implementations in other languages. Uh, currently the most prominent ones are the ones uh, that Result has partnered with, so Apollo and Hasura. So these are kind of the, the most used implementations for now, and they also have uh, the most features implemented. And basically, yes, yeah, some of the languages might not have the latest features of the GraphQL language implemented, but you can use it in other languages as well. But if you kind of dive into what GraphQL actually is, it can be used in different ways. It can, it can be a hub for your data to connect with the services you have behind your infrastructure. And basically there, it doesn't matter which language you're writing that server in, because it will only be kind of a hub. If you use GraphQL as your primary source of data, so it doesn't connect to any services, because in our implementation, we actually use GraphQL as a hub. So it connects to our underlying REST service, gives back the data, and that's basically it. But you can also write your business logic in GraphQL itself, and then GraphQL won't be the hub, it will be your central uh, kind of hub for getting the data to your clients. And there it's maybe even better to look into other languages that are more scalable and easier to manage. Uh, the next one, you have shown us a lot of benefits of GraphQL, but what are the disadvantages? I'll be diving into those soon, so, so I'll basically leave that one. But for now, um, four years ago, when we kind of went into this, 
in the company itself, the main disadvantages were that it wasn't as used. Uh, the, the developing patterns weren't implemented yet, so there weren't any kind of patterns on which we could be leaning by. So we as a team at Result, we were basically inventing our own patterns. So how, how to deal with things that REST has already solved. Um, but just to kind of give a main disadvantage, so I'm not saying that GraphQL will actually replace the current technologies we have. I'm just saying that from my perspective, my personal perspective, it will rest on top of those technologies. So I'm not saying it will become the primary language of developing KPIs. I'm just saying that it's a good language that will allow you to connect your services easier together in this new world that we exist in where we have like a lot of data floating around and a lot of services. Uh, but I will dive into some other disadvantages uh, soon. Uh, the coding example basically just passed arguments to the inherited methods of another class. Is the module you imported to do so the most used one? And if not, which are the most popular ones? Uh, so I'm not, not sure if, it, if you're talking about the REST data source. So that's an Apollo implementation of how it queries REST. But basically, you don't have to work on the REST data source. You can basically implement your own business logic on how you fetch your data. So that, that isn't, there isn't a common module that covers everything. Uh, you can write your own kind of code, how you do your business logic and how you query stuff. So it, it the REST data source is just the most common convention in Apollo to query REST data services. Uh, okay, that's currently for GraphQL. Maybe let's move on because this will be a really short one into how GraphQL really connects well to the environment you're currently in. So academia. Uh, and let's open up a topic. We all know graphs, right? So discrete mathematics. I was kind of fond of the subject. I really liked it, um, playing with graphs, looking for cycles, looking for Euler paths and stuff like that. Um, and that knowledge could really come in handy with GraphQL actually. So if we check the model we've implemented for our GraphQL API, the user is connected to the post, the user is connected to the comment, and the post is connected to the comment as well. And the main question here is, do we have a cycle in this graph? And we don't have a cycle in this graph. So user post comment or user comment. There are no cycles in this graph and this is okay. But what happens if we actually introduce one? So it's really unnatural to think that a post could not be connected to the user as well, or the user connected to the comment and the comment connected to the post and the post connected to the user. And this is how we can actually get a cycle. Um, and okay, so could this pose a problem? So we have cycles in our graph. So we can implement resolvers, we can implement our queries, but what happens if we have cycles in our graph? And could this pose some sort of vulnerability on our end? And as it turns out, it actually can pose a vulnerability. So what we can actually do is just walk around the cycle. So what we have here is a query which can basically turn our server into shreds. So if we just try to do a brute force like attack, we can basically just send out queries that are large, very, very large, because you can basically just nest these things. And this is a common kind of problem while developing GraphQL APIs. So the first challenge that we are faced with from an, uh, that's quite well connected to the academia perspective is the cycles that we have in our graph and what can we do with that? So this is one of the open problems. So query depth. And 
as I've said, it's an effectively a really good possible brute force attack on a GraphQL server. And currently the way how companies are solving it is that they are applying a limit to how depth you can do your queries. So they basically check out, uh, they check how, how deep their, their queries can run. And they say, okay, our depth limit is six and we won't be going any levels lower than that. And that's how they currently solve this problem. But that's not an effective way of solving it. So we still kind of, so this is kind of the chaos that is introduced when uh, one can do this kind of brute force attack. Um, and this is an open problem. And the initial problem that we have with GraphQL is that it actually isn't a language that has been formalized. So most of the languages that are out there are written in some kind of formalization, which can be used to analyze the language itself in depth and kind of solve the problems that can kind of jump out. But GraphQL in its way isn't actually a language. It's just some sort of query like protocol slash language thingy that isn't actually a programming language on its own. And that kind of presented a problem. How do we actually formalize this language and how can we actually formally study it? So if we don't have a formalization of the language, because the GraphQL spec was basically just informally specified, we can't actually analyze it. So we can't dive into it how, how it looks like. And Two years ago, when I was at a conference in Berlin regarding to GraphQL, uh, Professor Olaf Hartig, so he he's from Finland, uh, presented an article called Semantics and Complexity of GraphQL. So his main goal was to try to formalize this language and do an analysis based on that. So, okay, you know how these articles look like. So I won't be going into depth what this means, but just to kind of show it to you. So this article is publicly available and Olaf basically tried to tackle the problem of how to formalize it. So he used GitHub as an example. So GitHub was one of the first companies that actually uh, adapted the GraphQL language. And he actually did a test with the query depth on the GitHub server. And the thing is that they were preventing you from doing queries. So they didn't even have a query depth limit uh, two years ago. What they were actually doing is if the server timed out in your request, and that was like a minute or so, it actually tried to execute a long query. So this presented a problem. So the server resources were still being consumed. But in the end, you didn't even get a proper response because the query was basically too long. And that's what Olaf was basically tackling. So he decided to go basically on a quest to formalize this. And he also did some measurements on how the query length uh, kind of uh, does an impact on how the execution time starts growing. And basically, I won't be going into depth here, but from the schema, he basically defined a formalization of the GraphQL language. Uh, and with this, he was able to kind of propose an algorithm, which is somewhere here below, which actually kind of calculates how large the query will be, how large the query result will be, depending on what kind of query, what kind of query we are giving an input to our server. And this, this was basically an interesting uh, thing because um, it's actually really hard because GraphQL is kind of independent, so it isn't based on any language, and the backend that GraphQL is communicating to is also put can be anything actually. So it can be a REST service in Node, it can be a Java server, it can be a Python server, whatever. And it's really hard to kind of 
calculate how long a query will take. So basically what he did is he used his knowledge of graphs and kind of proposed an algorithm on how to calculate the size of the response and basically proposed a mechanism for future developments in GraphQL, how to actually implement this into a living GraphQL server. So instead of doing a calculation on a manual calculation on what kind of query that we have available, he actually created a mechanism in theory, which could make this thing kind of more dynamic. So instead of analyzing our graph manually and saying the query depth of our queries is going to be seven at the most, he did a dynamic mechanism which could basically help larger GraphQL servers to calculate their responses and also not to do a query if it's not feasible. And with this algorithm, he actually also found out that in theory, you could break up the GraphQL response into chunks and serve those chunks to the front end. So even if it is a very large query with a very big set of data, uh, this algorithm covers that as well. And it wasn't long when a bachelor thesis kind of arose from that. So Tim Anderson actually did uh, an implementation in JavaScript using the Apollo server of this algorithm. Uh, so if anyone is interested, it's a really good reading into how he implemented this and what's the theory behind it and stuff like that. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this still wasn't finalized and put into the Apollo server implementation or into any, any other implementation. So this is kind of an open area which could, which could lead into interesting kind of thesis topics that could solve this problem because it's a it's a wide it's a widely known problem but no one has actually implemented it directly into the servers and also push it push the code itself so this was just a proposition it actually worked but it wasn't kind of pushed into the main server in the end so it's still it's still kind of an open thing here so this is um kind of mind input into how GraphQL re really connects well with uh, with uh, subjects you currently have. Well, I think this was this was your first year discrete math because um, there are a lot of things like this that really need to still be researched. Um, so yeah, this is one of the, the open problems and the second challenge with GraphQL is also caching. So caching allows us to store data for a limited amount of time before querying databases yet again. And I've told you that all of the requests that go into GraphQL are post-based. So there are post requests, which actually means that it's hard to cache them and we need to kind of invent new mechanisms that tackle this problem. And at result, we actually did a small implementation, me and my fellow engineer, uh, Marco. It opened up a new thing for a per field caching mechanism because GraphQL is a field based query language. So why not just query fields on the server itself? And you can uh, see my talk from last year on this URL address if anyone is interested that dives into this topic and caching is also an open topic and from the from an academia perspective an open topic would be how to actually uh, realize that those cycles that you are doing in your queries are actually the same cycles so you need to just say to your code okay we're we're basically diving into cycles and the response was already present so i can actually eliminate those cycles and just return the first one and this is also an interesting topic that is open and can be um, solved by using some knowledge from discrete theory. Uh, and yeah, there are a bunch of problems that are open from an academia perspective and could really kind of dive well into the industry. 
Um, and yeah, there are also other challenges as well. So GraphQL currently, because it's, well, it has matured, but still there are a lot of open challenges that are open either in the community or in an academia perspective. So it's a really good field to be in right now. And we also have a lot of open topics on our end in our company, which we are solving internally. So uh, the community is actually growing. So there are a lot of kind of ideas here if anyone would be interested into diving into a bachelor's thesis that really connects practice and theory together. Uh, that's an interesting thing which can be opened on our end. Uh, so we're basically reaching the end and of course any GraphQL endeavors wouldn't be possible without my team. So. Um, I would like to thank my whole team for kind of solving these problems with me and doing fun projects. So this is the team that's responsible for doing GraphQL work at Result and we are spreading our wings currently with a Hasura partnership. And I would also like to welcome you all who are interested to keep the discussion open. So we've just opened a group on Facebook called GraphQL Slovenia. And you can basically join us and follow up any feature articles. So I'm posting a series of articles that dive more into the language itself and you can read more into it. Of course, I'll be also posting the coding example online so that you can play with it. There are instructions on how to run it. So if you want to join our group, please join and follow up the discussion. And on a side note, at result, we're constantly kind of solving new problems. And we are also always on the lookout for prospective people as well. We have these two things called Academy Hack and Academy Lab. So Academy Hack is a yearly event in which we kind of try to tackle an industry problem. Last year, we were doing some virtual reality using Microsoft's HoloLens. Uh, and I think we had like a really good event there. And the second thing is the Academy Lab. So the lab is basically our section of the company which does crazy experimentation like things which could kind of work well into our products and into our client needs. And one of these are the topics that are open from the academia perspective. So some of these we're actually already trying to solve or looking for solutions. So it's basically a very uh, good thing in which you can work upon during the projects that you're also working for. So uh, I would also like to welcome you to visit this site and check out the things that we are doing. And in the end, yeah, so this is the source code. I will also be publishing the slides online. Uh, if you would like to follow up my articles on GraphQL, you can follow me on Medium or Twitter or also connect with me on LinkedIn for any future opportunities. Uh, source code, as I've said, is on GitLab. And also, just like Journey said, don't stop believing. And now I would like to just go into our Jamboard and see what are the other open questions and also if any other questions arise. Uh, from your end, you can just post them here. So let's go into general questions. So you paint a big picture regarding using REST. Do you really think that the REST is technology of the past? Do you predict its demise? What about the SOAP? It is still enterprise technology. So I don't have a lot of experience working with SOAP. I've only used it once. Of course, these are technologies that will stay with us for the long term still. Uh, so, as I've painted my picture for GraphQL, I'm not seeing it as a replacement for all the currently technology trends. I'm seeing it as a layer on top of those things. So, the greatest power of GraphQL is that it has an uh, availability to connect services together, to have a unified language, to have a unified business schema, and this is its most powerful uh, feature. Uh, and also on that side note, things that I haven't mentioned during this presentation 
GraphQL can also be split up. So it can be split up into separate schemas and those schemas can be then sticked together. So Hasura is the technology that we are using for one of our projects. It's built upon a relational database, PostgreSQL. And this thing actually allows you to do foreign keys on things that are present in another GraphQL server. So imagine having a GraphQL server for Google Maps endpoints and in your database you have a reference for a Google endpoint and basically what Hasura does it calls another GraphQL and resolves that data for you and but for the front end user you can query data from a single unified uh, query like language and that's the the great power in GraphQL it allows you to connect various services together. It allows you to connect various graphs together as well. And again, from an academia perspective, uh, Professor Hartig, Olaf, uh, I think he, he had an open PhD position last year, which is tackling these problems. So the connection of various graphs together and how this affects speed and and tracking and stuff like that so that's also an open field when you connect multiple graphs together how do you keep your kind of uh, layers intact how do you keep your queries intact how how do you keep up with the speed and and general questions that are still quite open when connecting various servers together so yeah to sum it up i wouldn't say it's a replacement rest is here to stay because we like rest uh, but GraphQL is a really great way into connecting your services together. So this is for mid to enterprise level companies that have various systems uh, that need to be connected together.